quill nut, Professor Blaney? Uh, Gallipoli, um, Gallipoli inspired uh, a generation of Australians around 1915. Not everyone, of course, but inspired a generation. Uh, th they admired uh, the, the willingness to sacrifice uh, lives. Uh, they, they admired the courage. Uh, it had a nationalist component. At last, Australia was playing in the match of the day. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, <coughs> So for all those reasons, Gallipoli became important. Uh, I, 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 I'm slightly worried uh, about that kind of Gallipoli legend. Uh, the soldiers only got out of Gallipoli, those who were evacuated successfully, uh, because uh, our ally had sea power. Britain had sea power. Uh, we don't talk about the fall of Singapore, which was a great lesson to us uh, tens of thousands of Australians in the Dutch East Indies and Malaysia and Singapore w were imprisoned and large numbers of them died because we hadn't equipped them as a nation. That's a sad fact, but it's, it's true, isn't it? That's a lesson I think we have to learn. It's pointless uh, the way uh, from time to time in the 1990s, Mr Keating said, uh, Britain let us down, uh, 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 Australia made far fewer preparations for war than did Britain in the 1930s. Why then do you say Britain let us down? We let ourselves down as well. So I think the complexities of Gallipoli should be explored and understood. And that's part of the understanding of the Anzac tradition. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here from William. Yeah, Bill Thompson. Uh, look, thank you very much to the IPA for yet another fantastic uh, session. You guys have pushed a number of my buttons tonight, I've got to tell you. Um, <laughs> I was chatting with uh, Robert Mann at uh, the, the Wheeler Centre recently and I... My, my good friend, yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I asked him if he knew the opposite of uh, diversity, uh, which of course is university, and we had, we had a little discussion about that. But um, you mentioned Don Watson. Uh, I saw Don at the uh, Wheeler Centre. He was chairing a discussion of uh, a, quarter, a, a quarterly essay about the city and the country. And his first comment was, hands up anyone from the country tonight, because he wanted to know, because he was going to spend the rest of the night bagging the country. <laughs> that, that was how it went. Um, the, the gay marriage thing, I'd like there to be a plebiscite on this so that the people decide. Um, it used to be the love that dare not speak its name, and now it's the love that never shuts up. That's... <laughs> Uh, one way of looking at it. Um, speaking of the government attitude to rights, I used to work at the tax office and I complained bitterly about a brochure that came out maybe 20 years ago that said, uh, dealing with the tax office, your rights in big words and in little words, your responsibilities. And so, just a few points. Comments, response? Um, well, there's, a lot, there's a lot to cover there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think... I agree with Geoffrey. I think the rights and responsibilities is very important. And I was interested when I looked at, um, you know, the development of this argument about human rights. When you go back to the civil rights movement to Martin Luther King, he was very, very deliberate in his language. You know, he, of course, uh, you know, there should be emancipation, there should be equality for black people in America, but they must also act and, and live lives as good citizens. And the same rhetoric actually was picked up by Harvey Milk, the, the uh, campaign of homosexual uh, gay rights in America. Very, very clear in everything he said. You know, there, there are rights, but you must also act as good citizens. And, and so I I'd love to see if we could get that word citizens in the national conversation. I very much doubt it, but, but, but uh, that, that's, that to me is key to it. I think, uh, uh, just one brief comment. Uh, the, the, the life of Noel Pearson is an interesting commentary on this. Uh, when he was young, uh, he was very vocal for Aboriginal rights. Uh, now he's uh, doing great things for Aboriginal people by saying responsibilities is just as important a word in vocabulary. I don't think you'll find anybody who will dispute that. We have a question from Michael Kroger. Um, thanks, Tim. Just in relation to Ray Evans' question, um, and I wonder if you could comment on this, that... It seems to me that the answer is that since the 1960s, every institution upon which this country has, was founded and has made it great has been under constant and relenting attack. Every institution has been under attack. And if you don't defend yourselves, 
then you will fall from public grace and support. And I think the churches have been very poor, by the way, at defending themselves over the last 40 years. But if you look at the institutions in this, uh, and this list was made in 30 seconds, here are some of the institutions upon which this country was founded. Think to yourself, how many of these institutions and or notions have been under attack in the last um, 40 odd years? Um, the churches, the monarchy, our traditional allies, Britain and America, the mining industry, our power supply, profit, free enterprise, free speech, surpluses, <laughs> <laughs> traditional marriage, the power to determine who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come, <laughs> small government, independent schools, etc., etc., etc. Every one of the institutions which has made this country great has been under a sustained assault from the left since Woodstock. <laughs> Your comment. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, th I think you're right. Woodstock was the moment. I mentioned this in the book. But look, the, I think we, we've, we haven't got our heads around what happened in, in the late 60s and early 70s. Something very, very significant and dramatic happened to the intellectual zeitgeist, if you like, uh, which has, has changed the way we think about the world and has changed the cultural balance of power. And, and I, I, I came to this reluctantly. I mean, I was, I was, I suppose, well, I was at the, the back end of that generation, but part of it. And, 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 you know, we thought in Britain, as I know, you know, a lot of people felt in Australia at the time that we had to modernise, we had to move on, we had to become a much more socially aware and socially progressive country. So I've come to this position reluctantly, but I have come to the position that, that, that something happened which has not been altogether good. And, uh, and, uh, we need, we need, I think, to return to look for assurance from what went, or, or to look for our guide from, from, the, from the institutions that have served us well, instead of wanting to reinvent everything. Professor Blaney. Yes, the, I think the 1960s, the late 1960s, was a great landslide in, in so many ways. Uh, it took us all by surprise, and uh, we're, we're still grappling with the effects, but uh, me, me, that, that turned a whole generation, the young generation in a different direction, and uh, that's something that doesn't very often happen in history. Uh, we had a question from John Roscombe here, then the gentleman up the back, and then we've got one down the front. As the co-host, I'm going to ask two questions. Um, <laughs> what indulgence? Uh, the first one is an easy one to Nick. Uh, what will it take to convince Tony Abbott to sell the ABC? And the second one to the professor and, and to Nick. While, as you were discussing, the left and progressives were capturing our cultural capital, what were liberals and conservatives doing? And how do liberals and conservatives capture it back or at least rebalance the debate? Well, with the ABC, I, I, I don't want to see it sold. I want to see it continue. Um, I, 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 I'm a great believer in public broadcasting, but in good public broadcasting, that's what we don't get. I think, I think the, the number of... Ki well, first of all, you've got to have a, a, a big inquiry. There's got to be a new inquiry into the ABC. Much has happened since 1983, since when the last inquiry happened, particularly in the technology front. I mean, why do we need transmitters anymore? Um, you know, if we're going to get the MBN, you know, for better or worse, uh, we can have all our television programmes delivered down uh, that mechanism. Why can't we deliver public service broadcasting through YouTube or Google? Why does it have to be this massive institution? And this is important because what you see at the ABC is, is institutionalisation of a certain uh, point of view. You've got basically tenure there. You know, most people are on, on jobs for life, providing they don't, they don't do anything terrible. Um, uh, whereas at the BBC, my old home, you know, they moved to contracts, uh, which had, uh, you, you may not notice it, but, but certainly I, I know it had a significant difference is to have people coming through on contracts. So yeah, basically we have to dismantle the institution while not... I still think we have to make that investment in national uh, cultural capital, uh, either through the ABC or through other means. I wouldn't like to see us stop doing that. We need, we need much... But it just needs to be a much, much better institution than it is. Professor Blaney, do you have any comment? I, I, think, I'd, um, I think the ABC is important. Uh, Professor Blaney, you need a microphone. Yeah, sorry, I think the ABC is important. Some of its tasks it does... Uh, well, some of its tasks it, it does very poorly. Uh, I, I myself would uh, re decentralise it, I think. Mm. I think I would uh, say, well, this is a federal system. Let's treat the ABC as a... 
move it out of Ultimo and South Bank and send it out where people live. Yes, we might not take everything out of Ultimo and South Bank. They've got shops and so forth there that are useful. <laughs> There's profit centres. Yeah. Well, well I've, I've, in the discussion, uh, John, I've forgotten your question. The future. The future of conservatives or, or, or liberals or, or non-progressives is a word I hear tonight. <laughs> how, how, do, how do you defend your point of view? Uh, well, it, uh, it, 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 if you've got a point of view and you believe it's valid, uh, it's not hard to defend it, but the theme of Nick's book is that uh, the despising, the moral despising of people with alternative views makes it very difficult for those uh, who, who value their career and their friends uh, to take contrary action. Uh, but, but it can be done. Uh, I think we're living in the, we've been living for, in, for the last 150 years in a time when nearly everybody barracks for change. But uh, most of the good things in our society were here before 150 years ago. And uh, I think somehow we've got to move away, and, and it's very apparent in history books, and some of them I write. Change, change gets. Every chapter, mm. obstinious against change, gets very little mileage at all. I mean, to me, one of the great events in Australian history in the last 30 years was a non-change, the defeat of mixed Mr Hawke's Bill of Rights, <laughs> which didn't even allow private property. <laughs> I th yeah, no, I think, I think you've hit a key question there, John, uh, uh, the, the, the failure of of the conservative side, if I might call them that, although I mean, I, I don't consider myself a conservative, but um, to stand up for what they believe against this onslaught of views is the big problem. How do you do it? And Jeffrey's right, it's very hard, but there are many ways you can do it. And the best way, I think, or one of the best ways is humour. Humour is, is enormously powerful. And I look back to that, uh, uh, the, 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 in fact, the, ri the original uh, Bunyip aristocracy, you know, the phrase which was invented by Daniel Dennehy, the, the son of an Irish migrant. And he basically defeated the idea of an unelected upper house in New, New South Wales by derision. And, uh, and we can do that today. I, 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 I must say, I think that the work that was done, and you guys were instrumental in it, but others too, like George Brandis, in knocking off the latest sort of human rights, uh, or the, the latest sort of... Uh, Anti-discrimination. Anti-discrimination agenda, which is magnificent. I mean, every Labor government, outgoing Labor government, has left some new edifice uh, as its sort of calling card when it goes. Uh, this time they haven't been able to. And, and that was just, I think, people standing up and saying, well, come on, you know, this is nonsense. And, and look, we, you know, we can do that. We can be done. Uh, I think it's just building a consensus. And there are two questions just up the back there, James, the gentlemen. There were two. The <laughs> uh, but that's a, a, a very important point. I mean, one of uh, Robert Menzies' forgotten people speeches was very much about the importance of a sense of humour in public and political life in order to be persuasive. So uh, humour plays a key role. Tim Duncan? Um, is, is it a paradox that Australia built an outward-looking economy in the same period that all this... Um, narrowness of view uh, or the triumph of the narrow view appears to have emerged um, perhaps jeff and then nick Could he add another I'm, I'm thinking could you add another it? sentence <laughs> well do you agree that it is a paradox or not or that there's some connection between what what we what was an extraordinary deregulation and then repositioning of this economy towards an outward looking view which began in the in the 80s to result in, in, is it connected that at the same time we've seen a, a, a growing intolerance of diversity and a, and a triumph of, a, of whatever this progressivist sect is? Or have we thrown bar the baby out with the bathwater and becoming out outwardly, outwardly looking and internationalist and junking too much in the process? Which part of it is it a contradiction of paradox and which one part of it is consistent? Well, you, 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 you can't turn back the clock, uh, and, and, and globalisation in economic terms, of course, has been a tremendous benefit. And look, it's only a continuation of what's been going on for the last, or oh, Jeffrey would know, three or four hundred years, really, the internationalisation of trade and the benefits that that brings. Uh, you know, and as I said, the... Sorry? Well, I mean... Uh, could
Yeah, look, I, 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 I haven't really thought about the connection, but you're right. I mean, the, the, two, the two things were going at the same time. But uh. Professor Blaney, did you have a comment? Or? The, the, only com the only comment I can make is that uh, it's a pity we go to extremes. I think there was a strong argument in uh, pulling down parts of that huge protectionist edifice we had around the economy and other areas in Australia for 100 years or more. The, the case was strong, but the idea that became very common, especially in the 1980s, that we should be the world's leader in pulling it down <laughs> and boast <laughs> that we're pulling it down was naive in the extreme. Uh, there, are all kind, there are all kinds of industries that you should have a bit of. I don't know whether we, we need a, a, the kind of car industry we have, but there are a lot of basic industries that we should never let go of. You know, what happens if there's an international crisis and we're isolated for... To, to some degree by blockade or by embargoes. So the idea that uh, we can have this level of globalisation and retain our independence is absurd. So you think we're too globalised? Yeah, yeah, yes. That's my view, yes. Okay, there's a question right there. No, no, back, back, James, back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm doing it in the order in which people put their hands up, so don't worry. Hi, uh, Tim Wilms. Uh, you've talked about how the Australian governments over the years have tried to encourage uh, higher education uh, for everyone and how that's contributed to this um, uh, ruling class. So it's sort of a bit of like, oh my God, what have we created? Uh, 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 what's happening in the United States is that there's a real oh, sort of a rebellion happening against it in the in the sphere of what's termed as uncollege because people are starting to realize that in college they're not learning anything they're you know, they're tur they're turning out stupid and they can't get jobs and so there's these careers counselors now who come around to schools saying I will advise you not to go to college so could that sort of thing be appropriate take off here in Australia? I, I think it definitely will. And I've been telling people this for a long time. If you want to go into journalism, don't do a journalism degree. I actually know today there was a comment from Sir Richard Branson, I think it was at Griffith University, who actually actively told students that they should leave their university education because there was no value. And I think mar market forces will kick in eventually, won't they? I mean, you, you, we all know that uh, if, you, if, you, if, if, if I had taken up a trade qualification as a, as a plumber, I'd be earning a lot more money than I am now. <laughs> now, there's a gentleman right up the back next to the door. Yeah, uh, Michael Doyle. Uh, I think that every uh, Australian politician and probably every Australian journalist would say that they are in favour of democracy. But the difficulty I have with that is that uh, we've got compulsory voting. Would you like to comment on uh, that, uh, that frequently used cliché compulsory voting has served us well. As classical liberals, as I hope you are. <laughs> <laughs> compulsory voting, has it served us well or is it uh, something that drags down our democracy? I, I think that uh, th there's something great about uh, national election night. You know, it's, it's a kind of a pageant in celebration of democracy, no matter who wins the way it's now organised and celebrated in Australia, and that really depends on compulsory voting, but uh, I, 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 I think myself that it's asking too much of democracy that you expect that uh, the right government will be always elected even if half of the people don't even know what the name of the government is. <laughs> <laughs> it's asking too much of any system. <laughs> Don, uh, Don, uh, Nick, do you think Don's party is a rite of passage for the Australian life? Well, I, I'm, I am, I've been in two minds about compulsory voting for a while, but I'm now very, very firmly of the view, in fact, uh, this is something I'd, I'd argue enormously strongly, that compulsory voting is right and good for this country. Um, I think it does a number of things. One, I think principally what it, it, it's a responsibility uh, and, and we need to make sure people exercise their responsibility in a democracy. It has all sorts of other benefits. Uh, we don't, political parties don't have to spend all the money getting people out to vote. I think it, the, the issues at elections generally come down to mainstream issues. It kind of hones down to mainstream issues instead of being driven by sort of passionate um, activists who can pull people out to, be, to vote on a particular cause. So no, I'm very, I'm very, very um, 
strongly in favour of, of, of uh, compulsory voting. I think it's one of the things that gives us one of the most, one of the flattest and fairest electoral systems in the world. Uh, politicians can uh, go, go their own way if they wish, but they will be pulled back into line. And often you hear you know, people, sometimes amongst the elite, they complain that they don't, their vote doesn't count because they don't live in Lindsay or, or McMahon or one of these marginal seats. But the fact is, I think that in the end, the, 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 the issues hone down to those electorates that are really at the centre of the sort of spectrum, if you like, from progressive to conservative. That's where the battleground's fought. Uh, and so it's fought over crucial issues, I think, and it just happens to fall in those seats. Uh, but just a question down here with this gentleman right in the aisle, but Miranda. Yeah, just on this area, one of the interesting things that you note in the book was the careful but contrasting r political rhetoric of Labour and Liberal. Prior to the 2004 election, Latham advocated for a stronger, safer and fairer Australia, while Howard stood for a climate of stability, security and reassurance. The words used being a totem of progressivism and the other of conservatism, but largely being the same thing. Does this reflect the fundamental distinctions between the two sides of politics, or is the divide becoming merely semantic? Well, the I think the divide's still there, very much so. Uh, although it's very interesting to see many people on the Labour side of politics now talking about a, you know, what I'd think of as a sort of Menzies agenda, really. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that there is, it, it is interesting to see Labour sort of try and look for its light on the hill, you know, what it means, and increasingly struggling. I thought it was very interesting, thinking about this recently, that Julia Gillard for a time was kept saying, we are the party of compassion, you know, which was sort of, was struck me as sort of unrealistic at the time. It was as if anybody who didn't vote Labour had no compassion. <laughs> and, of course, the fi you know, she finally got a comeuppance on this the other week over the National Disability Insurance Scheme, where they were the compassionate party, uh, 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 they w they believe the national, but of course Tony Abbott was uh, was cycling, um, you know, 900 kilometres in f to support Carers Australia at the same time, as if he had no compassion. <laughs> Professor Blaney, yeah, did you I have a comment? You agree? Mm -hmm. uh, gentleman here behind there, and then there's a gentleman down the front. Uh, my name is Geoffrey Babb. If I could remind the IPA of a bit of its history, in 1996 the government decided to hold an inquiry into his citizenship. And I was hired by the IPA to write a submission on behalf of the IPA to that inquiry. Now, that our, our, our uh, submission was incorporated in into the report. And in fact, in several instances, we were quoted directly in pull-out quotes as contributing to the report. Now, I grew up in the era of the Vietnam War. Now, you mentioned Woodstock. I missed out probably by about one year on being conscripted to go to Vietnam. Now, this is probably the most unpopular war of modern times. People simply did not want to go. Now, when the Liberals embraced conscription, they immediately alienated an entire generation of young people. And I think if you're looking for where this drift of progressivism started, this is perhaps somewhere we can say, this is where we started losing people. OK, conscription, is that the origin? Do you find any? allies in your text? Well, this is where I think the, uh, the outsider has, has a disadvantage because I wasn't, I, did, I don't know what it was like to live in Australia in the 60s, I can imagine it. Um, but but I, 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 you know, I wouldn't dream to sort of presume to say uh, to the extent to which that might have contributed to the change. But there certainly was that move for change as we know now. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it was a very different country. Do you have any comments, Professor Blunt? Microphone, sorry. Sorry, in, in retrospect, uh, the imposing of conscription uh, did radicalise a section of the young who would not otherwise have been radicalised. And, and I think they felt a sense of disillusionment that something like a marble, am I right in my memory, something like a marble? The old yeah. Pats, the old Pats robbery. Yeah. Right. Yeah, th that, that should determine whether you had to make a sacrifice or not. It, 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 that didn't look well. Okay, there was a question there, and then there's the final gentleman down here. Thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about unhealthy developments in uh, the body cultural in recent decades. I wonder, Nick, with your uh, perspective and studies, what, what would you, can you identify anything positive that you think progressives have uh, added to Australia? And uh, secondly, can you, 
in your view, can you identify unhealthy aspects of Australia's cultural heritage, which you think we would be better served to discuss and um, work out? Um, well, that's a very difficult question. I mean, I, I, look, I mean go back to the well, previous answer. I, I'm not sure I'd really want to live in Australia as it was in 1962, 1963. I may be a bit unfair. But, I mean, certainly that, that sort of modernising, progressive instinct sort of brought this country, uh, made this country a better place, I think, in many respects. Uh, uh, I, think, I think the mistake we've been has been to sort of attribute all that to the Labor side of politics. Not true. You know, all many of the changes... You know, the ending of white Australia policy, even the sort of rise of sort of consciousness about you know caring for the the environment, uh, and, and certainly the arts are things that came out of the conservative side of politics, uh, but they just haven't proclaimed it. So it's a look, it's a it's a better country. I, I it is a hard question though. I mean, what has progressivism given? I can think of many things, many huge mistakes they've made for which they've never been made to account, but. Um, uh, I struggle. <laughs> yeah. if, if it's a general discussion on multiculturalism, it, it seems to me I could be wrong that uh, multiculturalism works well uh, if you have a policy of uh, tolerance allied to uh, reasonable levels of assimilation. If, uh, if you realise that uh, cultures that are too far apart they never resolve their differences. I mean, as the world is full of failed multicultural or whatever phrase you want to use, multicultural societies. But if they've got a lot in common, as in, as in Switzerland, they can work very well. Uh, if, if you've got extreme, uh, extreme Muslims uh, there demanding the, the rights to practice uh, everything they believe in and they do not accept assimilation, then you've got trouble on your hands, it's long-term trouble. Do you think part of that challenge is time frames? If you look at two cultures coming together in a short time frame, you won't get uh, common ground, but if you look at it over longer periods of time, you will get uh, more common ground. Yeah, yeah I, the, time frame, the time frame is very important. Uh, you, 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 you can't achieve uh, w w wonders quickly. Right. Gentleman, final question down here from this gentleman. Uh, <coughs> Murray Adams, wait. Uh, Nick, I haven't read your book yet. I will be buying it. I have read reviews of it uh, in various uh, sites on the internet. Uh, what's... Uh, I'd like to know whether you think this is fair comment. The reviews I have read so far seem to imply that you're giving more a description rather than uh, uh, any sort of prescription uh, as to what we should do about... Now, that's a preliminary to my point. This is something I've been concerned about for quite a while, and that is that democracy, at least in the view of many people I talk to, whether they're whatever side of politics they're on, has just become an exercise in putting a mark on a piece of paper every three or four years, whatever, <coughs> and in between, the politicians are a law to themselves. They do what they like, and uh, particularly when you write to politicians, as I have recently... Uh, in two different electorates uh, and all I get in response is printed party political propaganda. Uh, in particular, I live now at, in the seat of Isaacs uh, and the, the member <coughs> is the uh, uh, current uh, Attorney General in the Gillard government. And that's all I got from him when I wrote to him about a number of issues. One <laughs> up front one was climate change. Uh, he didn't even acknowledge the letter. And I, I think this is becoming a pattern. I'm wondering if you think this is a valid point. If you do, what do you think we can do about uh, it? I, I, I look, my book is more descriptive than prescriptive, you're right. But I think, you know, you, you, the yours is a valid point. And what we've seen, of course, is the rise of this professional political class. You know, uh, the, the, you know in previous eras, <coughs> politicians would do something else before they went into politics. Now you... Out of the 100 uh, or so members of the Labor Party in federal parliament, upper and lower house, one of them has a trade certificate. One of them has actually got a practical skill. Uh, 30 odd percent of them are, are, are lawyers, so or or have degrees in law. So uh, and, and it's not. A, I mean, the the, the, the Liberal and Coalition has not been side of politics not been immune from this either. Uh, but I must say that they have resisted it more. 
But the, the, in the end, this is why I come back to it, democracy, the ballot box. I mean, Labor is, if the polls are right, going to get a thumping message this time around in many seats that it would have thought were it's for life, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and I, much of that, I'm, I'm sure, is, is people like yourself who just feel they haven't been listened to and they want to serve a message. I mean, the, the great thing about democracy is, to Tocqueville observed in America, you know, politicians can, can, vary, can go break from the public consensus for a while, but not for long. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes three years seems a long time, but, but it's not in the sweep of history. Professor Blaney, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I uh, sympathise uh, very much with the speaker from Isaacs. I, I, I'm strongly in favour of uh, the Chartist idea of uh, a three-year term for Parliament. I know people say it's a pity they can't plan properly. I, I think it's great that they can't plan properly. Yes. 